Hello everyone, uh, welcome back to my channel. I hope you've liked uh, the previous videos and I hope you have already subscribed to this uh, footage. Uh, my name is Hans Jürgen Schönig. I'm uh, running a company called uh, Cybertech and we've been focusing on professional Postgres for 20 years. So today's topic is fetching large amounts of data. Um, recently, we've seen a couple of issues where uh, people were running into trouble because uh, there seems to be some uh, misunderstanding here, how, how Postgres fetches data and how it's returned to the client and all that. So I decided to create a video on this, uh, on this topic. So it's, it's fairly interesting, a small, easy to understand topic, but I think it has large implications on, on how you develop your applications, okay? So before we get started, let me introduce myself. Uh, my name is Hans. Uh, I've been in professional Postgres since uh, 1999. Uh, I've written various books on uh, Postgres, and we are running a Postgres support company uh, serving uh, customers uh, all over the world. Uh, as you can see, we've got a couple of offices uh, all over the place. And as I said before, we are serving uh, some big brands and a couple of uh, large institutions, uh, and we try to help them uh, run their Postgres deployment. So if you need anything, uh, related to Postgres, which could be Postgres support, uh, performance tuning, uh, if you want to migrate from Oracle. So feel free to reach out. And we're certainly going to get in touch with you and fix the problems. So reading data from Postgres, how does it work and what's going on behind the scenes? So when you send a standard query, What's going to happen is you send it over, over the wire through the front and back end protocol. Uh, the server is going to process the data for you. And then the whole thing is going to be sent to the client. So if you're doing select star on a 10 terabyte table, what's going to happen is that your client is going to end up with a 10 terabyte data set. And what's going to happen here is out of memory. It's not going to do you any good. So the solution to the problem is a cursor, okay? So back in the old days, uh, cursor was a pretty common thing, but uh, you know, given uh, bigger machines and uh, better systems and bigger hardware, et cetera, et cetera, uh, the concept of a cursor is not as widely known as it used to be. So I thought I'm gonna show you how it works, how you can make use of that. And uh, just to make sure that you get a decent understanding of, of how you can use this actually pretty old feature uh, in Postgres or in any database. Okay? So out of memory. So if you're reading, as I said before, if you're reading uh, 10 terabytes of data, what you're going to get is out of memory. You're going to get out of memory on the client side and not on the server side, because Postgres knows how to take care of data, but your client does not know how to handle 10 terabytes of data. So the solution to the problem is you've got to read data in chunks. And you got to trade memory versus uh, network round trips. Okay? So just fetch data in chunks, go to the network more often, but avoid out of memory in case this, uh, this happens uh, to you. Okay? Let's create a simple table. So we got to create table t test. And what we do is here, we use the generate the series function. Uh, which you might have already seen on this uh, channel a couple of times because it's, it's the best way to create just a small data set with a couple of rows, right? You don't have to insert anything. It's just, just generate the sequence of numbers. So in my case, it's going to produce uh, five rows, one, three, four, five, and we're going to make use of this uh, data set uh, throughout this video. So a cursor basically leaves inside a transaction. So if you're using a standard cursor, make sure that you start a transaction. Okay, so do it begin, and then we do declare cursor for select. So what they're planning to do here is to take the content of this uh, test table and, uh, and fetch it in pieces. Uh, so let's just fetch it in chunks. And the way we do that is we declare the cursor, the cursor is a name, and then we can do fetch next from my curse, and it's going to produce one row. So the trouble is that if you're reading 10 billion rows, 
calling fetch for every single operation, it's going to be really, really slow because you have to go to the network, produce one row of data, send it over the wire. So you're going to accumulate a lot of network latency. You're going to accumulate the many, many SQL statements. It's going to be ghastly slow. So what people usually do here is they use fetch and then they're going to fetch, you know, a thousand rows, 10,000 rows, you know, 100,000 rows, whatever. And the idea behind that is to call fetch on a data set you can still manage because it's going to fit into memory. And you're delicately going to balance um, network round trips and, uh, and, and, and fetch sites, okay? So what you usually found useful is, let's say, fetch 10,000 or something like that. So that, that's, that's usually a nice thing to have because it's, you're not going to use that much memory on the client because everybody's going to be able to handle 1,000 rows or so or do it for 10,000, okay? But certainly not fetch one and certainly not fetch two or something like that. You can do that in some rare cases, but in general, it's better to fetch data in uh, bigger buckets, okay? So once you commit to a transaction, the party is over. So if you're gonna fetch from the cursor, it says cursor, my cur does not exist. So as I stated before, a standard cursor is gonna leave inside the transaction and commit or rollback is going to end the life of the cursor. Okay, so that's super important concept that a cursor is always inside the transaction, uh, standard cursor at least. And uh, once you commit the transaction, the cursor is gone. So there's no problem with cleanup or anything. It's more like a pointer, okay? The backbone of uh, a cursor is uh, the fetch function, okay? So if you fetch data, um, you can take a look at the at fetch and you can fetch next, fetch prior, fetch first, fetch five, fetch all. You can read backwards, you can read forwards, right? So you can move within your the, within the data set um, the way you want. Um, so it's pretty flexible and uh, pretty easy. So you can read backwards, forwards, can read certain number of rows, whatever you prefer. So it's really easy. But keep in mind, you start a transaction, you declare the cursor, and then you fetch. Okay. However, in some rare cases, you might want the cursor to survive the transaction. So in this case, I'm going to start a transaction. I'm going to declare a cursor, but if you look closely, it says cursor with hold, okay? If you mark a cursor with hold, it's gonna survive the transaction. So suppose T-test contains five gigabytes of data. As soon as you commit the transaction, Postgres has to materialize the content of the cursor. So what commit does, in this case, it's gonna read all the data from the cursor, put it into some, uh, some special storage, and then you can fetch from this pre-calculated data after the transaction. So basically what we got now is a copy of, the, of, the, of this result set somewhere on the server. So select star from 10 terabytes on commit, you're gonna get 20 terabytes because it's gonna copy the data and materialize the cursor so that we can fetch after the transaction. So you have to be aware of that, that this can be quite time consuming and it can eat up a lot of space, okay? So it's not free, commit is gonna take ages. Uh, of course, if the result set is large only, uh, but on the other hand, you can read after the transaction, okay? So in this case, you have to be a bit uh, careful uh, because once we read the data, so here what we did is fetch all, Right, so we should have read everything from the cursor, but in the next slide, again, we still fetch from the cursor, even if everything has been consumed already. So we have to explicitly close the connection or explicitly close the cursor or explicitly discard everything to make sure that the connection is cleaned up. Because otherwise you're gonna materialize tons of data, you're gonna run out of storage, nasty things are gonna happen. Okay, so make sure that if you're using a withhold cursor, that you always do proper cleanup uh, of, this, uh, of this stuff, okay? 
So let's have a brief look at how the optimizer handles curses. So if you do select something where, what Postgres is going to do, it's going to, it's going to optimize the query in a way that you're going to get the whole result as quickly as possible. So if you run any query, the aim of the optimizer is to basically return stuff as quickly as possible. In case of a cursor, uh, the story is a bit uh, different because what you want is a quick response. And uh, there is this curse of tuple fraction variable, which is set to 0 0.1. And what it does is Postgres optimizes the query in a way that the first 10% of the result set are going to be produced as quickly as you can. Okay? So instead of optimizing for the whole result set, Postgres is going to optimize for the first 10%. So you can start fetching more quickly, but it might take longer overall. And you can also see that as a way to assume that, let, let's assume that the client is not gonna eat the whole data anyway. So if you're looking at a, you're selecting a million products and you're looking at them, and then you figure out, well, that's not what you need, okay? That's perfectly fine to optimize for the first, 10% uh, or so, because we, we might expect that in some cases we, we're not going to read it all anyway. Okay? But be careful, the cursor is going to use, maybe going to use a different execution plan than the same query without the cursor, because as I stated, Postgres is going to optimize for the first 10%. So I guess that's, uh, that's not worth it. And uh, it's certainly uh, something which should be in the back of your head uh, if you're using a cursor. So conclusions, uh, a cursor is needed uh, to read massive amounts of data. A cursor always lives within a transaction. It's a very old feature, it's very mature. You will find uh, similar concepts in most databases. And uh, if you want a cursor that's gonna survive a transaction, use a withhold cursor, but in this case, be very, very, uh, specific with your cleanup to make sure that you're not going to fill up your server with trash. Okay. So, uh, if there are any questions, uh, feel free to get in touch with us. Uh, make sure that you're going to subscribe to our uh, YouTube channel and make sure that you're going to hit the bell. Also, uh, make sure that you follow us on Twitter. You can also follow us on Facebook. Of course, you can get in touch with us uh, through our website. Uh, leave a comment in the comment section below, and we're certainly eager to hear uh, which topics you are most interested in, uh, because then we can just produce a video on those. Um, so we're certainly interested in uh, user feedback to make this channel even more interesting and uh, maybe gain some more subscribers and help people out there to run Postgres properly. So thank you for your attention and uh, have a nice day.